I thought we could try something a little different today. So um, in the middle of this terrible thunderstorm, in the middle of all this stuff going on, uh, I thought I could just record this now, record it early, and let's just see what happens. Let's take advantage of the full power of scheduling things and just see what's up, shall we? Let's, uh, let's, let's just try. Who knows? Uh, no great preamble, but uh, we'll do all the usual stuff. And I'll see you right back here in a second. All right. Just remember what I've taught you. So, ladies and gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, friends, writers, makers, doers, dreamers, pantsers, plotters, enthusiasts, people who have ever been suckered by sales copy, anybody who's ever had to work on a day where they feel like they've done a million things of work already, chess players, video watchers, casual streamers, casual gamers, people who really like that satisfying moment when apps update, anybody who's ever managed to do multiple loads of laundry and dishes and still feel like a big accomplishment. Anybody who's ever cleaned a room and discovered stuff they thought was lost. People who are willing to work on themselves. People who are willing to give more than one or two word answers to questions. People who are thoughtful. And most importantly, the comrades. This is the Writer's Chat for September the uh, 12th. And through no fault of my own, I continue to be John, the guy who's going to help you write better. Hello. And if this is the first time you're here and the first time you're checking it out, welcome. Normally, this space that you're currently looking at has a big-ass graphic in the middle, but uh, I forgot to make one. So for now, let's just marvel at the stock photo. And I'll, I'll tell you what this is. This is the writer's chat where uh, I'm going to answer questions from all corners of social media. Um, I've got 13 of them. I'm looking forward to their answers. Uh, since I'm pre-recording this early, not to spoil it, there's no questions from chat, but normally on a day where I am streaming live to Twitch or YouTube, one or the other, it's been Twitch lately, but on the day I am streaming, there are also questions from people in chat. However, today I'm recording it because uh, today is one of those days where uh, I'm just recording a batch of stuff and getting it out. So rather than try and pretend that it's Tuesday any more than I already have, let's just get started. Question number one. Why do so many of my ideas seem to stall out after 20 to 40 pages? Okay. Normally when this happens, the first thing a writer thinks is, holy shit, I'm a bad writer, that this is terrible and awful and I'm not good enough to do it. What you are forgetting and what you are probably not even aware of is that this is entirely normal because the fault isn't yours. You, you did the best you could. You wrote for 20 to 40 pages. That's still pretty significant. However, it's not your fault. It's the idea. Or maybe it's how you put together the idea, the presentation, but mostly it's the idea. It needs more time to cook. It needs more time to, for you to poke it with a stick, there's there's a lot more that it needs to accomplish and do. Not all ideas you're going to have are full-sized novel ideas. Some of the ideas you have are better suited for shorter fiction, novellas, short stories, poems, free verse, songs, art, whatever. But a lot of it isn't always going to be a novel. And to force those ideas into a novel without really changing them, without really interrogating them, is a great way to get really frustrated and stalled out with your writing process. 
Now, some of these ideas, in order to turn into larger ideas that can contain or carry a novel, really just require you to think through more things. What's the antagonist? What's the obstacle people are overcoming? What's the goal? Why is it hard? Why is it easy? What's in the way? How are characters growing and shaping? And for a lot of writers, especially a lot of writers who are desperate to feel something that they can identify as writerly. They want to be a writer. They, they think it's really important. It's very important to them. And they, they want to have some kind of great moment where the skies part. I'm saying this during a rainstorm, so there's a little bit of irony here. But the skies part and, and divinity shines upon them and they, they write the great novel. Uh, that doesn't happen, uh, but that doesn't certainly stop people from trying. Nobody's ideas jump out fully formed. No novel springs to life without iteration, without development, without interrogation, without some frustration, and most of all, without thinking it through. So, so many of your ideas stall out after 20 to 40 pages because they're 20 to 40 page ideas. That doesn't mean you failed or screwed anything up. That's just how big the idea was. If you want to take it longer, you got to think more on it. Poke it with a stick and see what happens. On we go. Question two, if I have two points of view, two POV, is alternating between them the only way to use them? No. It's the most common, and it is the most probably understandable way to use them because alternation gives us exposure to both of them. We have point of view number one and point of view number two, and we, we have one, and then we jump to two, back and forth, and maybe we space it out a little bit so it's one, 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 two, 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 or one, two, one, two, or one, two, two, one, or something. But there's always this division of the story across these points of view. That helps us tell a more complete story if you don't do that. It's okay, like you're not breaking a writing rule or anything, but the the question you're pointing or the question the reader is going to have, we'll say it that way. The question the reader is going to have is why is there this second point of view? Like if you tell 80% of the story from one point of view and then 20%, maybe the climax of the story from somebody else's point of view, it's going to feel like all that goodwill you've earned and developed and all that engagement and, and sticking around with the reader and they care and they sympathize and they're invested. You're going to chuck it out the window. I don't care if the reason for the POV shift is something plot based, like we've killed off that major character and, and now we're just sort of left with this other character. Um, no, it's not going to do what you think it's going to do. If you're trying to suggest that uh, we want to make one character feel more impactful, then you need to rebuild a different framing device and have your number two character, the character who would be picking up after the death of the first character, you need to find a different way to frame that story and not necessarily give them a point of view. Why your character, one or two, has that point of view is the question you should be trying to answer for yourself first and, and like your organizational stage of writing so that you can then move forward and move between the points of view, whether it's alternating or not. But once we have a clearer idea why we are writing with the point of view we're writing with, why do we have two points of view? Why not just one? Other than, well, I want to write with two points of view because, well, I mean, that's not a really a reason to do it that's that's just sort of ephemeral and we want to do better so yeah alternating isn't the only way but it is the best way and it works and sometimes we don't have to try so hard to reinvent the wheel when we're trying to stand out as a writer please consider why your point of views are the point of views you have and go from there all right on we go Question number three, is print on demand better than bulk printing? Is it environmentally better? Okay, so this stems from my previous comments that I think traditional publishing is part of the many reasons why we are crushing the planet, like in a not good way, that the demand for paper and printing and shipping contributes a significant, a huge, a massive carbon footprint that we are not addressing and we are not willing to look at from a writer 
publishing industry standpoint because everybody's still enamored with the nostalgia of, hey, I want to hold my book. I, it's only real to me if I have a physical copy. And I, I, I understand. I get it. But we have to think about more now than just what's going to satisfy us. It is, we are, we are past the point of selfishness. We are in uh, a decaying civilization on a dying planet. And we really probably ethically shouldn't do anything to hasten it. I understand that we are maybe past the tipping point where we can, you know, retard the damage or repair it. But that doesn't mean we need to speed it up just because you want to have the extra special feeling of holding a thing you wrote because somehow holding a physical printed copy of a thing you wrote is somehow better than holding a digital copy of a thing you wrote. Print on demand is a really popular option for for self or small pub and self pub because it's cheap and because it, you, you don't end up with 10 boxes of books in your garage. Is it better in terms of like just quality possibly it depends on your printer is it better in terms of fitting your needs as a small creator as a self-publisher yes if you don't want to get stuck with a dozen boxes in your garage and if you don't want to shell out for that money and worry about the printing and the shipping and all that stuff and you just want to have a few books for a few sales totally is it environmentally better no one print book is too many printed books. It's still the printing issue. There's still, you know, pulp wood and diesel fuel and shipping costs and carbon footprint and, and truck exhaust and all these different things. You're, you're just having it happen on a smaller scale. My issue isn't the size that's the problem. It doesn't matter if we have 50 trucks or 500 trucks crisscrossing the country doing whatever. My problem is that there are trucks crisscrossing the country. My problem is that we are still spending a ton of money to put very big boats dumping diesel waste stuff all across the ocean because somebody wants to hold a copy of a book. There's nothing wrong with a physical copy. It's nice. I own many physical copies of many books. It's delightful. But when we have the option, when we have the ability, the luxury, the privilege to create our art and choose the way we provide our art to be consumed, we strongly have to consider what effect our choices are having. Yes, it's going to make us feel very, very super de duper happy. I hear you. I get it. But at the same time, is our happiness more important than, you know, contributing to a greater social problem? Maybe we just want to think twice about it. That's all I'm asking. On we go. I don't have any uh, chatter, so there's no pause for chats. But here's question four. On the podcast, you mentioned performing the act of being a writer. I've mentioned it a few times. I believe it's out this week on the podcast, it might have been earlier in last week, but I've mentioned it before, especially lately, performing the act of being a writer. What do what did I mean? Here's what I mean. People who write, artists, creatives, many of them, especially inexperienced ones or ones that are seeking a great deal of validation or attention or uh, ones in need of a lot of support and and architecture and buttressing and cheering on and all that they think that being a writer is some kind of like big thing like all of a sudden they're going to write a number of words or they're going to like um accomplish a task or go somewhere or own something and then all of a sudden poof whiz bang they'll be a writer you know, as if you weren't a writer when you wrote your 79,999th word, but the minute you hit 80,000 words, that's it. You're a writer. Or the minute you got your first rejection, up, oh, that's when you're a writer. And you, they begin to consider the process of writing, the, the mechanical fingers on keys, hand on pen kind of a thing, as well as just the act of shaping and crafting a narrative story to be this role that it has to be done a certain way 
And it has to be done a certain way because if I were to do these same tasks but in a different method, I would not be a writer because writers behave and operate and act a certain way. And they do it with certain tools and they do it at certain times and they do it under certain conditions. And anything that isn't those times and isn't those ways and isn't those conditions somehow makes it invalid. This is not the case. This is just gatekeeping with a funny hat on. Because if you are writing, you are a writer. If you are putting your stuff out on the internet somewhere for someone else to read, you have published it. Just because it didn't go to a big magic building somewhere like in New York City and have somebody send you a letter saying it's good enough and then somebody handed you a big giant cardboard check doesn't mean that you're not published. The performance of being a writer becomes more about the, the dramatic performance. The, the sort of sense of like, look at me, I'm wearing my writer's sweater and I'm, I'm using the writer's software and I'm going to the writer coffee place and I'm doing the writer things. I'm doing all the things that I think my writing heroes do or did or have done or will do. So that must make me the writer. And it becomes about showing off that performance. It's, it, it's about, it, it turns into um, playing this role rather than helping yourself or, or reaching yourself or reaching someone else or sharing your nature or connecting or building a bridge or expressing yourself. And it just becomes about this, this costume and this cosplay that you go through in order to shape and craft something. All you need to do is write. That's it. And you need to connect through your writing, through the, the medium of your writing, you need to connect to other people by expressing yourself. And you will discover that you and these other people on the other end of the writing transaction have a lot in common and you're just trying to put words to it. That's what it is. There, this, this extra sense of a writer does X and a, you know, a not writer does Y. All of that nonsense is just hot air. It accomplishes nothing. It means nothing. It's fruitless, which is all the more reason, I guess, why it shows up so frequently in like writing spaces and writing communities because they're populated with people who don't want to do writing. They want to do the act of, they want to do the act of being a writer. They want to do the things that they think will garner them social proof and credit and attention for doing the, the motions, but not doing the meaning. I, I liken it to, you know, cooking. We all have to cook meals to eat food or we all have to go out and buy food cooked by someone. But there's a difference between, you know, us cooking dinner, whatever it might be, whenever it is, to going to school or being trained to be a chef. You might look and go, well, chefs have tattoos. They have expensive knives. You know, maybe it's like the bear. Maybe it's like burnt. Maybe it's, you know, what I see Gordon Ramsay do. I have to be like that if I want to be a chef. I have to do those sorts of things if I want to be a chef. And no, no, you don't. To, to be a chef, you just need some training and you need to work with food. And you need to serve others through food. You need to make food. That's that's a chef's job. The act of being the, the chef, the tattoos, the swagger, the cursing, the aprons, the throwing plates across the table, you know, across the room, the the jargon, the slang, the um, the sense of theater to it is inconsequential. You don't have to try so hard to be a writer. You can just be a writer. That's what I talk about when I talk about performing the act of being a writer. Don't get caught up in the performing. Don't get caught up in the act or the label. Just go do the action. Just go do the writing. And everything else is either going to fall out of the way or it's going to become inconsequential. Good question. On we go. Question number five. Is a lack of curiosity really a writer's biggest problem? Yes, I talked about this on the podcast, absolutely positively. A lack of curiosity is, I think, worse than a lack of discipline. Because you can learn discipline, right? Like you can give yourself the habit, you can train yourself and condition yourself to 
add more time to your work. You can spend 30 minutes a day and get into a reading habit. You can spend an hour and do a writing thing every Saturday. You can condition yourself to gain some discipline to do whatever you're doing. But if you're not curious, if you can't tunnel through and dig through all the things in your life, in your activities, in your this is and in your that's. If you can't like dig in here and really have a moment where you're trying to answer a question about yourself because you think that in in the search for the question and in the demonstration and expression of the answers you can connect to someone else, then your writing will always be a little flat. Here's what I mean. You're not just making a fantasy story. You're not just writing the story about a YA protagonist going, you know, trying to pass her classes to graduate high school. I mean, that's what the story's about, and that's the act you're doing. You're typing the words that allow us to imagine that there's a character who's going through those experiences, and there's a character doing that stuff in these rooms with these people. But that's the surface. That's like the top of the iceberg. That's the 20% we can see. I'm challenging you to think about the 80% of the iceberg under the surface. And that means you've got to figure out, one, why you're saying what you're saying. Why tell me this story? Other than because I think it'll sell well or because I want to because those are juvenile asinine answers and I want more and you should respect yourself to give more. So those don't work. But you want to figure out why you're telling the story. What is it about being that young adult trying to graduate high school? What is it about being that, that person in a romantic relationship? What is it about being the, the character who's on a noble quest to improve themselves? Whether or not we are traveling across the kingdom or sailing a ship on the seas doesn't really matter. But if what is it about the experience of these people, these characters, that you have something to say about not just that you can retell it because anybody can tell me a story about a person who goes from point a to point b that's not even close to what i'm talking about i'm asking you in your understanding of what it's like to go from point a to point b what is it you have to say what are you saying about your experience of going from point a to point b that might connect to somebody else who's also had an experience of going from point a to point b and if you're not even remotely curious about that if you're not even remotely interested in describing that or if you're the sort of person who hears me say a thing like your journey from a to b and your first and maybe only thought is to sit down and detail your life you're only ever dealing with the 20% of the iceberg. That 80% needs your attention. Human curiosity, human nature, human expression, human experience, what connects us, what binds us, what shares, you know, what things are shared between us, what challenges us, what links us together, what repels us, what attracts us, things that make us build bridges to one another. That is the value, purpose, and function of art. And if you're not doing that, if you are not getting there, or if worse still, you've somehow convinced yourself that the best way to build a bridge to another person is to tell yet another story about somebody on a quest and just stop the thought train there, your writing will always suffer. You will never get through the glass ceiling you think there. Uh, think you could. You'll never get the sales or response you want because at the end of the day, you're thinking only about the 20% and you're ignoring the 80. Next question. Question number six, is writing a talent or a skill? Yes, I, I know. I'm splitting the difference. It is both a talent and it is a skill. This is a contentious question that is so often wielded at writers who are frustrated, usually by writers who are trying to gatekeep or maintain power. I've seen this used in Facebook groups to chase people out. I've seen this used in Discord communities to bust everybody up. I've seen this used in workshops. I've seen this challenged philosophically. It's a hot button issue and it sucks. Writing is a talent. You can be very good at it somewhat innately without a great deal of specific education. You can just be good at it. Education will make you better. 
knowledge of terms, knowledge of ideas, knowing how things work on beyond an intuitive level is possible. But that innate core sense of like, I'm just good at telling stories. I get it. I understand the idea of what it means to try and connect to somebody else. I understand what it means to try and express myself. Putting jargon aside, putting style and theme and, and terminology and all the, the weighty vocabulary aside, you have an innate sense of what makes a story, what makes it satisfying, and what a story needs versus what a story doesn't need. That's the talent part of things. The fact that you can perform, you, you can produce this and perform the, the storytelling craft part well, that's talent. Skill is brought in. Skill is is given is is trained and developed skills are mastered learned attempted failed at skills are the education they're learning the terminology they're attending workshops they're asking questions they're taking notes they're challenging yourself and pushing yourself to do more than just constantly and solely rely on the innate talent because yeah you'll have the innate talent for as long as you maintain it and use it and do something with it but honestly it's going to cap out because you'll need education You'll need to learn something. You'll need to push past. You'll need to challenge and grow. Innate talent doesn't grow. It just is. It is skill on top of talent that allows us to go even farther. Writing is a talent and a skill. On we go. Next question. Question number seven. What is a clipped action beat? So a clipped action beat is a kind of action beat. There are many, 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 many different kinds of different kinds of beats. A clipped action beat is where each, let's imagine, because I'm trying to do this without jargon so that it makes sense. In an action beat, let's picture a wheel with spokes. Each spoke helps support the overall wheel and make a wheel a wheel. Every spoke counts. If we take a couple spokes out, it still might be a wheel and it still might work, but if we take enough spokes out, it's not really going to stay around. It's not going to be a very strong wheel. If we remove those uh, spokes, we lose some of its wheelness. okay? An action beat has components. Uh, those are actions and reactions. There's a variety of other things, but we can just focus on these two for now. The clipped things or the things that are clipped in our action beat are those spokes, are the actions and reactions. Either they're clipped because we keep them very short in very short sentences with very, not necessarily well-developed, but at least stated actions. This happens, that happens. The, you know, he puts his hand here, she puts her face there. The, the gun goes off, bang, this, that, one, two, three, very short sentences, staccato, one, two, three, four, five, like we're, we're just rapidly counting. We are shortening the length of each of these components inside the action beat. And that's what makes an action beat clipped. A clipped action beat just has tiny spokes. It has tiny, short little actions. Overall, generally, a clipped action beat is an action beat that needs more revision. It needs more expansion. Because, yeah, it's saying what you need to say. The gun goes off. The bank robbery happens. But... You could spread it out. You could expand it. You could detail it some more. You could say more shit. Clipped action beats do have a utility. There is a point to them. We can use them when we just want to set something up, have it happen, and move on. Like a bar fight that happens because the next scene is, you know, somebody's been arrested and they wake up in the drunk tank. And it's more important that we do the post-fight stuff than the ongoing fight we can use a clipped action beat to move us along. There's value to it. It's useful. But a clipped action beat is just made out of small pieces, and it runs the risk of needing development. And that's a situational thing. It's not always a given. It's more of a case-by-case, -case, how did you write it, what are you trying to accomplish with it sort of thing. What a great technical question. On we go. Question eight. How do I know how far apart to space my info dumps? I don't want to bore my reader. Okay, that's legit. Nobody wants a bored reader. I hear you. My question, though, is why do you have so many info dumps that you have to worry about how far apart you're spacing them? It's not that there's a magic number of info dumps. It's not like, well, you have four, but five, and you're screwed. 
It's not like that at all. What matters is why you have so many and why you're worried that they're boring the reader. Because that kind of makes an assumption as to how you think the reader is or going to be. And it kind of has an underlying assumption that the reader is going to take one look at your work and automatically be bored first rather than engaged, which you have no way of knowing. None of us do. But it is an interesting question. And it is something worth thinking about because you do want to space them out. If we clump them all together, you know, let's say we stick them all on the first 30 pages of the book and the book goes on for another 300 pages. The stuff in the info dump, especially if we mash it together with like a lot of different info dumps, is the stuff's going to get lost. The reader's not going to remember. You want to put your info dump wherever the material from the info dump is going to do the most good. It's going to not necessarily be the most inform informationist. You don't want to highlight it solely for its info, but you want to make sure that that info or that info dump, I should say, connects most closely to the actions that it spawns. So let's just set this up with an example so it makes sense. Let's suppose we have a military sci-fi story where the, um, the colonel comes into the room to inform his mech pilots about the mission they're about to go on for our story. The colonel giving the briefing, explaining, I don't know, topography, enemy locations, planet stuff, gravity, all the, all the science-y stuff in our military sci-fi story. That info dump is going to inform the reader, but it's also going to make the characters aware of things. And the characters now with that awareness are going to be prompted to do something. Not just sit and listen to more talking, but like, okay, I've been informed. I know to expect the monster in the cave, and I know to expect this kind of gravity, and I know to expect that, you know, I have to fall out of the spaceship or whatever. That information leads the character to take action or have a reaction. So our info dump leads to moments of utility. It gives us an opportunity to do something in the story. When we think about what it is the characters are going to do, we have to go back and ask ourselves, well, what caused them to do this? Other than the blanket statement of, well, if they don't do it, the story stops, because we want to skip that. That's not important. We are looking to see if we can connect the dots and go from, he said this, so they did that, whatever it is. We don't want to stretch that too far. The problem is that too far, I'm making air quotes, is really subjective, because too far for me, based on my writing style, is not necessarily too far for you based on your writing style. But you're going to stretch and space those info dumps out according to the amount of action they breed. So if we have this info dump where the, the colonel gives a mission and then sends the, the unit off and that's the whole story then that info dump comes first and the rest of the novel follows. We don't have to check back in with the colonel. We get one info dump. But if we get an info dump to inform our, uh, our characters about something, they land on the planet, and all of a sudden, after a few more events, we need to get a new info dump from a new person. Maybe they discover the, the survivor of some previous wreckage, so it changes the nature of what they know. Now, with that changed information, they move forward. Your info dump always works forward to create opportunity. So think about the opportunity and figure out where to position the info dump for it. And it's going to be variable on everybody's writing style. Don't assume automatically they're going to be bored. Excellent question. On we go. Question nine, what's the best way to fix a sales funnel that isn't working? Okay, putting aside the obvious question of how is it not working, or how do you know it's not working? There's a couple different things we can do to improve a sales funnel. If you don't know what a sales funnel is, a sales funnel is the setup of emails or links or clicks or call to actions or posts or material that somebody, a consumer, a reader, gets involved with in order to buy the book, whatever it is, whatever the book is. So the best way to fix... A, a not working sales funnel is to first identify the parts that aren't working. It's probably not the link. 
though that is worth checking. Maybe you just typed it wrong or you're, you're linking the wrong thing. That's the first thing to check. Beyond that, though, we have to see the length of this funnel. A very short length is pretty straightforward. Here's a link. Click it and buy my book. See link, click link, go to page, click buy, get book. Very short sales funnel. Maybe there's one piece of sales copy, one paragraph I read on the website to confirm that, oh, yeah, I do want this book. And then off you go. Very short sales funnel. Big sales funnel. Anything bigger than that. And that could be a number of emails. Let's say you sign up for the email newsletter and then you get a, a week's worth of welcome emails and then you get a couple freebies and then you get you know pulled into whatever the current sale is because, oh man, there's you know always a new thing on, going on, a new class, a new project, a new whatever, a new chance to you know give me your credit card money. That is... That sales funnel, if that goes on too long, you've got to worry about two factors. One, are people staying invested? Because if I tell you something today and then you don't see a payoff for it for like 11 chats or 11 weeks, are you even going to remember, unless you write it down and pay attention, are you even going to remember what I said the second week or the first week of September, 11 weeks from now? If I don't bring it up because I just keep moving along, this is why so many sales funnels feel a need to constantly remind you what it is they're funneling you towards. Hey, you know, come check out this course. You know, this course, here's this case study for this course. Here's the freebie. Here's the book. Here's the book. Here's the genre. Book, 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 genre, 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 course, 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 class, 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 sale, 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 sale. Chances are most sales funnels don't work because either the chain of access, meaning the place I start and the place I get to are too far apart. It takes too long to get to the thing. Probably because the person creating the sales funnel is really trying to grab as many people as possible. So they've stretched it out to make sure that they can get all their hooks in the water. Oh my God, I've got to try going for this customer and try going for that customer. And I got to write like this and ooh, I got to catch those people over there with that. If you're curious about the particulars, uh, there's a, on the YouTube channel, there's a fantastic breakdown of customer types. It's that sort of idea. But it's also a problem if it's not working because it's, if it's not taking too long, it's unclear what it is you want them to do. The other major problem with a sales funnel, if it's not too long or too, sh or, or too like hasty, like just buy my book, damn it. The other problem is a general lack of request. It's not saying enough. It's not clear enough. It's beating around the bush that it's even a sales funnel. That's, that can be a real problem. So the best way to fix that is to tighten up your sales copy. Not just shorten it. That's not what I mean. I mean write more effective sales copy and go forward from there. Generally, a sales funnel is, well, all right. So the commerce part of the answer is, is that a sales funnel is not working if you're not getting enough sales. Ha ha. Which is kind of shitty, like awful, because yeah, on some level, the point of the sales funnel is to create sales, but also the point of the sales funnel is to build audience, but your audience can't only be transactional consumers because that's exploitative. Like if we're just, if you're just my community, because you're here to buy something, once you've bought something, you don't have to stay in my community. You can just go away and then come back later when you want to be a new part of my community again. That's, that's a thing that I'm poking my head around. Generally, to fix a sales funnel, you look at the length. Maybe there are too many pieces. And you look at the sales copy. Maybe it's not engaging. My, my John, personal curiosity is the depth of the sales funnel. Why are you doing it the way you're doing it? Could you do it differently but still get the same result? And do we always have to solely focus on metrics like clicks and open rates in order to, in order to get things where we need them to be? It's something we're thinking about. On we go. Question 10. Would you go back to Zoom? And if so, how would you use it differently? So I left Zoom. I am no longer using Zoom for client meetings. I'm using Google Meet. Uh, and the reason I'm primarily using Google Meet more than Zoom is because Zoom updated their terms of service at one point to, to really do a lot of like AI data mining and scraping and stuff. And I did not want 
my stuff or my client's stuff or anything we discussed somehow funneled to teach a, a you know a language learning machine or a learning model anything because no that's ethically unsound and shitty and plagiaristic and I, I don't I don't want to see that stuff propagate so I didn't use it I no longer use it I have heard though I have not personally confirmed because I canceled my account that you can opt out. I don't know how uh, rigid or accurate that opt-out is. I'm assuming you can because people complained about it, but I'm also assuming that it's not really like a like a hard and fast, totally opt-out. I think it's more of a, yeah, you can opt-out, but everybody's got their fingers crossed kind of a thing. If I went back to Zoom, let's say you could opt-out, and I was feeling pretty confident about the opting out of AI, if I felt good about it, I would go back. Uh, I would go back because uh, a lot of my workflow with it was better. Um, I had more bells and whistles to play with. I had more fun toys to play with. Uh, I, I liked it. Uh, it also let me swear better. The, one of the major problems, and I know this sounds very silly, but one of the major problems I have with Google Meet is when you look at the captions or the transcript, uh, it blots out all my cursing, which feels a little disingenuous. It feels a little shitty. So, um, other than that, like I like Google meet, it's nice. It always wants me to put a camera on, which is gives me, which gives me tremendous anxiety, but by and large it's, it's okay. Like it's not the end of the world kind of a thing, but I would like to go back to zoom. Everybody and their mother still uses zoom. How would I use it differently? I would, I would use zoom to try and do more things. Yeah. I would do client meetings on it because everybody's used to using it. Sure. But I really want to try and push like a writing group. I really want to try and grow in a couple new directions this fall and winter. And one of them is a writing group. And I think doing something on Zoom on the regular because I'm, I, I, I follow a lot of writers and a lot of other creatives who put together meetings and, and, and stuff on Zoom for subscribers and for followers and for different things like that. And I think that's really worth exploring and doing something about. So... Let's give it a try. That's what I would do differently. But I'm still on the fence. Um, I, I just don't know. I'd, I'd like to go back to Zoom, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sold yet. Let Google Meet disappoint me once or twice, and then we'll, ha we'll reconsider this conversation for sure. On we go. Question 11. Is there a better, it should be way, not why, is there a better way to gain experience as a writer beyond just writing badly until one day you're magically writing better? Oh boy. Okay, first of all, let's, let's disabuse ourselves of this notion that crossing some magic threshold is what makes you a better writer. You are not magically better at your 90,000th word than you were at your 89,999th. It's not the milestone that makes you better. It's what you've learned along the way. It's what you've learned as you reach to the point you've reached. You're not writing bad. Here's the, the problem with this comparison. It makes it sound like you're at, you know, absolute zero experience, absolute worst skills, and then all of a sudden a switch flips, and now it's super skills and super everything. And... That's not, that's not even close to what happens. That's, that's not it at all. Your path from where you're at to you writing better is a hierarchical, progressive journey. You build on your successes. They are irregular in size, irregular in frequency, irregular in consistency, and they scale in difficulty most of the time. It gets a little bit harder as you go. It gets a little bit more frustrating as you go. And sometimes you get discouraged more often and sometimes you feel lost and sometimes you feel excited. And it's a whole big, you know, twisty, crazy roller coaster. Your experience comes not just from intentionally writing badly, because if you're always intending to write badly, you will always write badly no matter how much writing you've done. You can gain experience as a writer through writing. But you also gain experience as a writer by exposure to writing. This is why we encourage people to read 
other things outside of their genre, outside of just the popular books that everybody swears you need in a query letter, outside of all that stuff to influence what you're writing. So if you're writing science fiction, sure, read some science fiction, but also consider reading some biography or read some, you know, historical fiction or read a, a Western or read a, a drama or a thriller or something. Read whatever. Look for loads of different stuff that you can gain something from, not just tick a box like you're doing the summer reading for school. Learn from as many places and sources as you can. Learn from all lots of different media, television, film, streaming services, loads of different stuff can teach you about writing because although it's not always words on a page in paragraph form, it is the byproduct of writing. Somebody wrote that script. Somebody wrote that movie. Somebody sat down to think about that dialogue. And that can be influential to your own writing. So beyond just, I'm going to write bad until one day I'm not, you'll never be done writing bad because you think there's a hurdle to climb, you know, a specific thing to do. It's like we talked about with performing the act of being a writer. That's that thinking. That's that idea that one day suddenly, magically, it just changes. It doesn't. You want to surround yourself and, and, and focus yourself on what's going to give you opportunity. What's going to be something that empowers you? What's going to be something that fires you up and makes you give a shit and makes you care? Now, here's the wrinkle. It can't just be the same thing over and over. I get it. You really, really love that anime. You really, really love that TV show. You've watched it like six times. Okay, but it's time to do more than that. It's time to do more than just pay homage to your favorite author. It's time to either stop doing it or step out on your own. And your experience as a writer comes from taking those steps forward closer to more authenticity on your part than it does on just the, the, the production and increase of a number on a screen. That's the best way to gain experience as a writer. Move closer to yourself by exposing yourself and surrounding yourself in cases of writing, be it finished products like television shows or movies, as well as prose and drafts. That's how you do it. Next question. Question 12, what do I do if my beta readers like my work, but they all mention different things I could do going forward? What, what this question's asking about is like, ah, oh, your book's good. Now, I think you could take the ending in this direction or take the ending in that direction. Or, oh, what about this if this happened at the end? And all of those things are options. You don't have to act on all beta reader feedback. You don't have to do what they say. You don't have to take it as like a prescription that you must fill or instructions that you must follow. If they like your work, beta reader job done. Hooray. Have a party horn. That's it. That's all you need. If they mention other things, you get to decide on an individual thing basis. Do you like that idea? Does that sound good? Do, do you, I mean, if they give you a good idea and you're excited about it and you think it would work and you want to see if you can do it in your work, give it a try. But if they mention a thing and they're excited about it and you are not, not because they're bad people, just because they're talking about a thing that doesn't do diddly squat for you, you don't have to engage with it. You can just, you know, thank them for their feedback, say, oh, that does sound cool, and then not do anything with it. And then if, of course, if they ask, turn around and go, well, you know, I tried it, but I just couldn't pull it off and call it a day. That's no, no problem there. Just because a beta reader excitedly tells you the thing doesn't mean you have to like suddenly jump up and um, like go right straight for what they're talking about. You don't need to. There's no reason. Listen to your beta readers. They told you everything is great and what's working and what isn't, and then, and then go from there. All right, on we go. Question 13. I want to self-publish my book. How am I going to stand out if I'm doing what everyone else is doing? What a great question that is. Um, there's no real easy way to say this, but a lot of people do publishing the way everybody else is doing it. They, um, they get 
this kind of cover artist. They get this kind of cover. They title their book a certain way. They do this kind of layout. They do this kind of thing. They use this color palette. They use this model over and over and over a thousand million billion times until, you know, they get what they want. And it makes it really hard to stand out because the more they make their stuff like what everybody else is doing, the more they're forcing their only standout point to be the writing itself. Now, granted, that's a good thing. We want your writing to stand out from everybody else's. That's awesome. However, there are so many other points in this chain, so many other links, so many other opportunities for you to stand out that it's really worth considering doing something like that. You can stand out at any point in this process like this. You don't have to title your book the same way. You don't have to use the same color palette as somebody else. You don't have to have the same kind of cover design. You don't even have to have a cover. You don't have to have the same back blurb. You don't have the same back, you know, back blurb style. You don't have to publish through Amazon. You don't have to you know, charge $2.99. You don't have to give away a free sample. You don't have to have an audio book. You can have an audio book. You can have an audio play. You can do a million different things. Every step in the publishing process is an opportunity for you to stand out. However, here's the catch. Here's the wrinkle. Every time you step away and do your own thing, that is a point in this system, a point in this strategy where you are going to have to do some work. It might take time. It might cost money. It might be a pain in the ass. But it's worth doing if especially you're going out of your way to make sure you stand out for more than just your writing. Most people hear that and they decide, I don't want to go to the expense I don't want to be hassled. I just want to do everything the easiest and fastest I can. And then somehow I'll stand out, I guess, like randomly. I don't entirely know. But hey, that's what they try and do. But remember, every step in this process is a step for you to stand out. You've just got to be willing to challenge and look at what the status quo is and figure out if you want to do anything different. And that, my good friends is the end of this week's chat. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for, for checking this out. I really hope you liked it. I know it was short and kind of rushed, but thanks so much. I look forward to the next stream and the next time I'm here and the next things we're talking about. All power to all people. Thank you so much for letting me talk about all the things. I even forgot the outro. I got so caught up in stuff. So let's hit that nice, happy outro. And then we'll, we'll march on out of here. So give me 10 more seconds. If you like this stuff and this was, you know, what you were looking for, feel free to head over to patreon.com slash John helps you write better, where you can absolutely positively uh, help support everything I do for $2 a month. If you're looking for more individual help or if you have questions or if you just need a hand doing whatever you're doing, head over to John helps you write better.com. Uh, don't forget, by the way, that if you uh, go to wherever you get your podcasts and search for John helps you write better.com. Uh, you can find a ton more things, including all the audio from all the chats ever, ever, ever. There's a pretty good backlog. There's plenty of stuff to listen to. And if you always want to make suggestions, uh, patreon.com slash John helps you write better for more. Thanks so much for being here. I'll talk to you soon. See you.